Advancements in medical science are helping us live longer, healthier lives. Diseases that were once death sentences are now treatable or curable. My next guest, very cool person, Sam Kulkarni is the CEO of CRISPR, a company that is developing gene-based medicines to defeat some serious diseases. The innovations at CRISPR, Sam, have been fascinating to me. Uh, and so let me just put it to you bluntly. How are you going to save us? Thank you, Steve, for having us. Uh, CRISPR is an incredibly powerful tool that's been uh, harnessed with, from bacteria. Bacteria evolved over millions of years to be able to develop a pair of molecular scissors with the barcode that they can use to cut viruses and protect themselves against viruses. The CRISPR technology utilizes this technology from bacteria to be able to make changes to our genome. As you all know, the code of life essentially is our DNA, which carries about 3 billion base pairs. And if you can use CRISPR to make a change directly to the DNA, we're changing disease at a fundamental level and providing cures. We're, medicine's very quickly going to move from this paradigm of taking pills and injections to a paradigm where we're going to have uh, CRISPR-based or other technology-based manipulations of your genome to fundamentally change DNA and cure diseases. Well, tell us, I mean, we have a lot of uh, folks watching this right now, and, and so trying to make it as accessible to people to understand. Um, in the COVID area, I know that there have been a number of there are a lot of different uh, companies racing to try to find a vaccine. Some are DNA-based, some are RNA-based. I don't know if you're involved in this process at all, but when you get down to that, that level of, of um, you know, essentially genomic-based uh, medicines, what can, what, what can we expect? Because a lot of this has never been tried on humans before. Yeah, and, and let me give you the example of sickle cell and come back to your COVID right. question. Sickle cell is a disease that's caused because there's one base pair change in your letter of code of life. And it turned out that in the, in the past, um, there were big bouts of malaria in, in parts of Africa and other parts of Asia. And if you had sickle cell, you were protected against these diseases. And that led to a proliferation of what should be a rare disease. There's over 100,000 people in the U.S. who suffer from sickle, sickle cell disease. What we're doing CRISPR is essentially going in and making a change in the DNA of the, of the patients. And when, we, when I say make a change in the DNA, we're taking their bone marrow cells, making an edit to the bone marrow and replacing your bone marrow cells. And that effectively confers and overcomes this mistake in the DNA. And that once you're treated with this procedure, uh, you should be cured for life potentially. Uh, the first patient that we treated not too long ago uh, was profiled by NPR, uh, and this woman who was 33 years old at the time and had three children and lived with a life of pain came in for this procedure involving CRISPR, and since being treated with CRISPR has been symptom-free and not required any hospitalizations. So that's a fundamental change in that person's life that should lead to a longer lifespan but also a much better quality of life. And so that's how this technology is very powerful. Uh, you asked me the COVID question, and in many ways, the, the whole essence of CRISPR was to inactivate viruses. So in many ways, it's the most elegant way to inactivate a virus, except that we're not ready at this point from a technology standpoint to be able to deploy CRISPR in, in, the, in, a, in the time frame that's required to suppress or treat COVID. But I'm pretty sure over the next few years, you're going to see advances for CRISPR in many different disease areas. One of them is virology where we could potentially deploy a technology like CRISPR uh, to inactivate the viruses uh, and treat diseases. Um, we're also making advances in cancer, where we take immune cells and engineer them to kill cancers, and in regenerative medicine, where we, we create entirely artificial pancreas or kidneys to potentially treat diseases like diabetes. And cancer, that's CAR, the CAR-T therapy approach, right? Correct. It's called CAR-T, and it made a lot of news the last few years because uh, a, a young woman named Emily Whitehead was treated with this, with this therapy. Uh, CAR-T stands for chimeric antigen receptor. I know it's a mouthful, but essentially what you're doing is taking your immune cells and making changes to the immune cells to go kill the cancer. Your, your immune cells, which have evolved over time to kill viruses or bacteria, you, you make it forget what it's evolved for, but you put a new targeting moiety on there that says, go kill the cancer. And that's how you use CAR-Ts. 
what we're doing essentially is even one step further. We're taking a young person's immune cells, and the young person typically have robust immune system, much stronger than a patient's immune system, and re-engineering and redirecting these this young person's immune system to go kill the cancer. And that's what we call a cell therapies, but that could be an elegant way uh, and a very powerful way in our fight against cancers. This may be an unfair question, but I'm fascinated by these kind of one cure uh, therapy, one, you know, one, what do you call, one uh, uh, time curative treatments. And I mean, it sounds like a, you know, space age movie, you go sit in a little box, you get, you know, all, all you know, fixed up and done. But I mean, one of the questions I have is just, will we be prepared, will you be prepared over time? Because you're gonna need such scale at some level. And so I, I have been following CRISPR, uh, and I've seen how CRISPR is applied to things, you know, outside of human health, you know, been applied to agriculture and, and, and other sectors. So, so what, is the, what are the scaling challenges for, for the kinds of um, therapies you're bringing online? Yeah, and this is going to be a new paradigm that's going to require us a change in mindset. Uh, medicine's going to feel more like surgery. You know, nowadays yeah. you go in for a hip procedure, for example, it's an elective procedure. You go in, you choose the hip implant you want, and you get a hip replaced. And this is going to feel that way. You're going to go in, pick the right technology to have your bone marrow cells replaced or your stem cells replaced to cure diseases. It's going to feel very different, uh, not only for the patient, but it's going to feel different for regulators. It's going to feel different for payers and the entire health system. Um, so it's one thing, you know, for us to be prepared. It's an entirely different thing for the, the system to be prepared to embrace a technology like this. For us, you know, we've had the benefit of equity markets that are very supportive. So we've been able to deploy hundreds of millions of dollars in scaling up these, the manufacturing and the supply chain required for these procedures so we can do it at scale. And by scale of today, we mean only US and Europe. We eventually want to take this to other parts of the world as well. And that requires an order of magnitude higher scale, uh, which would require further investments. But at this point, we, we believe that we're well set up from, uh, from a perspective of technology, but also funding to scale up to meet the needs of patients. But I think we do need to have further changes come into place when, in terms of how Regulators think about a technology like right. this and nickel trials required, but also how the payers and health systems think about it as well. Let me give you one last question. We have just like a minute left. Um, let me ask you the Dr. Strange Love question, which is, I know you're a good guy and your company is, you know, uh, applying itself to real public health problems. What if you were a bad guy? And, and, and there are bad guys out there that with this technology could potentially do some very bad things. Um, and, and we've seen things, things that have gone outside the governance uh, rules and norms, like in China, uh, with, with babies that were born um, that had been cured of HIV. But you know, beyond, I'm just sort of interested in what do you think needs to accompany the innovations you're making in terms of governance? Yeah, I, I think that's a very good question, an important question. We've drawn a very hard line to say that we're only going to apply this technology to somatic diseases or somatic cells. In other words, changes that are not heritable to your children or offspring. Uh, but there have been instances, and you saw this example in China, where the editing was performed on embryos, which means you're creating an entirely new species or line of, of humans by making that change. Uh, and I don't think the technology is there. I don't think society is there to embrace that. Mm. The other threats essentially are, can this be used for, you know, bio warfare? And, you know, what I have to say is the the U.S. government has been very much on top of this. You know, there have been several uh, folks in the Congress, uh, in the Senate, who are quite familiar with this technology. Uh, it is upon us as companies with the most advanced technology platform to bring this to bear in a very responsible fashion for disease, serious diseases. But over time, that's something, you know, the entire governments need to monitor to make sure this technology is brought to bear in a safe and effective manner, only for good intentions. Well, Dr. Sam Fulkarni, CEO of CRISPR Therapeutics, it's a real pleasure to talk to you. I'm a big fan of the company and research you've been doing. Thanks for sharing your insights with us today on, on where all this is going. Thanks for having me, Steve.